Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Good day everyone and welcome to the second annual Generation Celebration event presented by the University of Washington's Age Pride Healthy Gen Center and the National LGBTQ Plus Health and Longevity Center. My name is Alexa Manila and I'm proud to be your host today. We have so much to celebrate. Our goal is to celebrate our wins solidify our common ground in the context of a global pandemic and honor those we have lost. While we celebrate advances in health and longevity, we're also committed to illuminating the steadfast work needed to advance racial equity and intersectional justice. Last year, we hosted a two-day event, and this year, we're not letting COVID stop us I'd like to invite you to grab your favorite beverage and prepare to be thoughtfully and intentionally inspired and informed and delightfully entertained over the next hour. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Our presenting sponsors are Ages Living, Long-Term Care Advisors, Gen Pride, and the University of Washington School of Social Work. Thank you for joining me to help link lives, honor our histories, and claim our futures as we combat social isolation across all LGBTQ plus generations and allies. We want to start this event with a land acknowledgement by Karina Walters, enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Halito, Sahachifa at Karina Walters, Micha Chata Sia Hoke. Good afternoon. I want to recognize that we stand in the lands of the Coast Salish people of the Duwamish Nation here at the University of Washington. There were six longhouses that used to be here at the university, and we are acknowledging our continued relationship with the indigenous peoples of this land and the Coast Salish peoples of this territory. I stand with all of you and acknowledge indigenous peoples of the territories that you stand in and encourage you to continue to get connected with the indigenous communities in which you serve, in which you live, in which you play. Thank you. And now it is my deep honor to introduce to you Professor Karen Fredrickson Goldson, who with her stellar team made all of this possible. Dr. Karen Starler's work over decades has had a tremendous impact on our community. She is the Huyman Endowed Professor and Director of Healthy Gen Center and the LGBTQ Plus Health and Longevity Center at the University of Washington. Dr. Karen is an internationally recognized scholar and in our community and others, she has made visible health inequities across invisible yet at risk and resilient communities. Dr. Karen leads multiple landmark federally funded studies and is the author of more than six books and over 100 journal publications. Dr. Karen has received the University of Washington wide Outstanding Teaching Award, the National Inaugural NIH Sexual and Gender Minority Distinguished Investigator Award, the Gerontological Society of America Award for Healthy Aging, and PBS's inaugural Next Avenue's Top 50 Influencer in Aging. Dr. Karen has now led the first ever statewide report of the LGBTQ Washingtonians of all ages that she will present today. Thank you, Dr. Karen, for the commitment and difference you have made in our communities. Please take it away. It's so good to be here together to celebrate. There's so much excitement. So thank you so much for joining us today. I wanna to start by thanking my incredible team at the University of Washington. Three decades ago, when I first began this work, I met Tricia, an 86-year-old lesbian, who told me she had been in a relationship for 50 years when her life partner died. In her words, she said, I have no one. We never told anyone we were together. I witnessed her deep, solitary grief. She shared, I go to the local center because I don't have anywhere else to go. But she never gave up, and she also lightly joked, I have fallen in love with the piano player 
She hasn't noticed me yet, but she will. I love grit with wit. So that is why we're here today, to explore real LGBTQ experiences across generations, looking and thinking about similarities, differences, strengths, challenges, and perhaps most importantly, intersections across and within our very diverse communities. Who are LGBTQ people in the state of Washington, and what are our experiences? It's equally important to ask ourselves, why are we mostly invisible in our state reports? Why don't we have an existing snapshot of our community? Invisibility creates vulnerability. So, along with 45 different community partners and our research team from the UW Schools of Social Work, School of Nursing, School of Medicine, and the School of Public Policy, we sought to answer these very questions. And today, for the very first time, we now have an accurate snapshot in the Washington State LGBTQ Equity and Health Report. We are diverse. Over 1,845 LGBTQ Washingtonians participated in this project. Our multiplicity and intersectionality reflect the fabric and vibrancy of our communities. Our communities in the past and present are resilient, powered by the resilience that built and nurtured them and their communities. But waves of trauma have cast and continue to cast a long shadow on this community. When I gave a talk last year in Houston, I was stunned to le learn that 28 trans women of color were murdered there last year, an epidemic of violence. These are quotes shared by Anya, Prasad, a doctoral candidate who studied with us last year and is working in our research on violence and the bias and the impact of bias and violence in the lives of trans older adults and all LGBTQ older adults. In our study, participants accounted for the traumas they have faced. Alex, a 19-year-old gay man, recounted the experience of conversion therapy. As he shared, I was forced by my parents to be who I was not. There was no choice, I was kidnapped. Our project found that last year, more than half had experienced victimization and more than 45% were bullied in the past year with over 60% bullied by their families. This is in our state. Compared to heterosexuals and cisgender people, in the state of Washington, LGBTQ people experience elevated health disparities. And the strongest predictor of these disparities is the historical and contemporary trauma and biases they have and continue to encounter. They experience elevated risks of disability, poor physical and mental health. Trans and gender diverse people and LGBTQ veterans have high rates of suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts. Many of the elders in our st study are experiencing social isolation. Many had strong networks. I mean, they built our communities, but with advancing age, many cannot or do not receive support from their peers, and their worlds are constricting. These elders are less likely to have children, less likely married or partnered, and more likely to live alone than heterosexuals. And it's not because they're not married or don't have children, but where is the safety net? One finding in our study is that young people have comparable levels of social isolation, which was a surprise to me, which is why we are committed to building bridges, linking lives, so all in our community are not alone. Yes, now we are in the context of COVID-19, and it's having a, a, a grave impact. Although not our first pandemic, it's creating even further isolation. Invisibility creates vulnerability. Relentless waves of trauma have and still do surround us. Our resilience and resistance through our communities, within our communities, joining together, it's always how it's been the most potent tool and it will continue to be so. And that is why impact is so significant. How do we create a safety net when worlds and connections constrict? How do we ensure support for one another? Our work is about impact and innovation, about bridging the gap between science and service. We develop Gen Pride and the Healthy Gen Center, which are now both receiving King County funding for more LGBTQ programming. 
It's a collaboration. We've also developed the world's first memory loss program for LGBTQ older adults. It's funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute on Aging. It addresses those unique risk factors in the lives of LGBTQ older adults. Our research first illuminated that elders in our community need affordable housing, a place they can call home. Based in large part on our research and analysis, according to Mayor Durkin, the city of Seattle and the state are now funding the first ever affordable housing. This is a project of Gen Pride and Community Roots Housing, and it's going to build communities first affirming affordable housing. And our most recent innovation, we just received funding from the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to develop the first evidence-based training for nursing homes to ensure LGBTQ seniors can be visible and that they are included. Today, we will hear about experiences within specific BIPOC communities. We're also going to enjoy engaging entertainment. And later in the event, we're going to hear about our new program to reduce social isolation. I now want to turn our attention. I want to welcome Brent Butler who is currently, currently responsible for the City of Seattle's Age-Friendly Programs, which implements health and wellness initiatives for older adults and persons with disability. Brent has served as a city planner and has advanced equitable planning and housing and community development, including in the International District and with Washprig. Brent obtained his graduate degrees from Harvard University and the University of Washington and has served as likely Olympia Peninsula's first black elected official. Welcome, Brent. During Black Lives Matter, I was painfully reminded of all of the times that Martin Luther King's dream of us living in harmony with our white brothers and sisters had been tarnished. Fortunately, I have lived in Western Washington for the last 15 years. This was before the polarizing and hateful rhetoric gained traction on the airwaves and by some in the community. For me, a new unfamiliar sense of dread culminated during the Black Lives Matter movement. First, this was highlighted by a pre-pandemic incident where a police officer pulled me over a few blocks from my Port Townsend home and asked if the vehicle I was driving was mine and if I resided in Port Townsend. I responded that I'd been on the city council because there was a residency requirement and the police officer walked to his car. Upon returning, he said he'd run the wrong plate. During the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, something new happened. Someone with a Confederate flag in their car drove slowly behind me while I walked downhill on a quiet side street without any people or traffic. I only noticed the Confederate flag as the car passed. I saw something swinging inside that caught my attention. My first thought upon seeing the flag was, oh my God, thank God I was walking opposing traffic because it would be hard for him to run me down. My second thoughts were, did he see me leave my house? Does he know where I live? Because my home is on a somewhat busy intersection by small town standards, I felt exposed. Whenever I get my mail, mow my lawn, or do regular tasks outside, I began to realize that people see me and that some of them may harbor ill will. Consequently, I've decided to move to a less visible location. I have often felt that my gayness took the back seat to my blackness. Yet, at times, the opposite is true. I spoke to a pair, a peer who alarmed me by sharing that some trans people of color did not feel safe 
within CHAZ, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Because I am older, I understand this feeling. Because I travel frequently overseas, and some of the communities I travel to criminalize activities like loving someone of the same sex, I was especially dismayed by hearing that the same intolerance was not only in Washington, but in my own backyard's safe space. This encouraged me to consider and discuss intersectionality between lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and two-spirit, and race, and the disparities that exist. One example, there are critical disparities in access that could increase the impact of COVID-19. It's difficult in parsing out how digital equity varies from BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and LGBTQ plus two-spirit folks to others in our community. Yet the Seattle, the city of Seattle's pre-COVID 2018 technology access study echoes critical findings. There are significant differences in access, access rates across demographic groups. The city of Seattle is now supporting digital access to tablets through senior centers. And there are a host of virtual programs from health and fitness to healthy aging. Some senior centers have online programs. The city of Seattle's human services department continues its age-friendly programming and other departments such as parks and recreation, the Seattle Department of Parks and Recreation are making videos available online. I believe they have some 30 videos that you can look at right now. And you must not forget that there are virtual villages, which are online communities of support. One of the most common statements I hear from community members is the need for a community center or space that is safe. It's important as a result that we support intersectionality in our communities. As a first step, invite qualified people of color to join your boards and focus on persons with lived experience. Support mentorship roles where we can learn together. I am where I am because of the people who invested in me. Encouraging the growth of persons who are not represented in our work serves as an investment in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Brent Butler. Your work is incredibly important. Next, let me introduce one of Seattle's most beloved performers. Arnaldo Innocentes first performed with the Seattle Men's Chorus and has stirred with them in major concert halls in the United States, Europe, New Zealand, and Australia. For over 20 years, Arnaldo has graced many stages and cabarets from coast to coast and has received numerous awards and honors. In 2016, Arnaldo was presented by the Filipino community of Seattle with a Lifetime Achievement Award for promoting culture and the arts. Arnaldo is a wonderful friend of mine and recently shared the following thoughts with me about taking care of his own elderly mother. I have an elderly mom. I help take care of and come to see her twice a week during weekdays, bringing her lunch, and often spending the weekends with her as well. Not everyone can be a caregiver as it takes a lot of patience and empathy. I know since out of nine children, only two or three actually come and give her care when they can. I know that as her world gets smaller, every little thing that remains in her world becomes so important. I feel privileged to be able to be with her during this time 
and able to provide comfort in my own small way. So I treasure our remaining years together. And like her, my world with her is getting smaller and smaller and less and less as the days go by. She will always be my number one fan. Friends and family, please welcome the incredible, the amazing Arnaldo Innocentes singing Believe. change the path that you must go believe what you feel and know you're right because the time will come around when you'll say it's yours Believe that you can go home Believe you can float on air Then click your heels three times If you believe, then you'll be there Believe in yourself right from the start Believe in the magic that's inside your heart. Believe all these things not because I told you to. But believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, just believe in yourself as I That I've heard of once in a lullaby Somewhere over the rainbow Skies are blue And the dreams that you dare to dream They really do come true Someday I'd wish upon a star And wake up where the clouds are far behind me Where troubles melt like lemon drops Away above the chimney tops That's where you'll find me So If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can I? Wow, 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 Arnaldo transforming into Arnaldo Drag Chanteuse. My best friend, you already know this, I love you, you are amazing. Something I truly believe in is reducing isolation between generations. 
And that is our goal today. We are raising funds to help bring our community together and to build bridges through an innovative mentorship program. I would like to encourage you to give now. Civil rights advocate Charlene Strong shared why she is giving. With COVID, so many unseen older adults are suffering and they're lonely. I give because I want to help reduce loneliness by connecting diverse generations. Simply click on the green donate button at the top of this page to donate now. Next, I want to welcome Professor Karina Walters, who earlier provided that beautiful land acknowledgement for our show. Karina is a Catherine Hall Chamber Scholar and the Principal Investigator of the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington. Karina has more than 25 years of experience in social epidemiological research on the historical, social, and cultural determinants of health among American Indian and Alaska Native populations, as well as chronic disease prevention and intervention research. She has expertise in decolonizing methodologies, particularly with respect to designing community-based, culturally grounded interventions. Some of her work has examined two spirit populations. Please give a warm welcome to Karina. Hello, well, I'm back and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about historical trauma. And, um, but to talk about that, I, I'm not going to focus so much on uh, the drama of that trauma, but rather I want us to think about, as I share with you about historical trauma and two-spirit experience, I want you to think a little bit about water, actually. When you take a sip of water today, think about that water as it rose to the heavens and came back down, that when you touch that water to your lips, when you take that water into your body, you're actually touching the same water that your ancestors touched. You're drinking the same water that your ancestors were nourished by. It's the medicine, you know, our, our teachings tell us that water is our first medicine. Most of our world is made up of it. Most of our bodies made up of it. We were birthed from our mother's waters. Water is life. And when we think about that and we touch our lips to that water, um, we are connecting directly to our ancestors. And in that way too, when we encounter uh, the stresses and strains of everyday life today, so too do we carry some of the stories and experiences that our ancestors experienced as well. And in that way, we're connected to historical trauma in the same way it's passed on. I also want you to think about historical trauma from a different perspective too. I want you to think about it, uh, really it's about power. And uh, when my ancestors walked that trail of tears uh, into the 1830s, they walked that trail with a vision of love and life for me and for our future generations to live. They walked with that, that power and that vision for us. So I want you to think about that in terms of vision, in terms of power. I'd like you to think about this. In this moment, if I take action for my health and well-being as a two-spirit woman, I'm not only empowering myself, but I'm actually giving opportunity and connectedness in life to my future generations. It's also a chance to heal past generations because I also carry their stories in my body and in my experiences. It's not about disempowerment. It's actually about power. And it's about love because our ancestors, as they walked that trail or whatever stresses and strains and historically traumatic events they encountered, they actually walked that so that we would live to the full of uh, abilities that we have to be healthy and well. So they had power, love, and vision. So when I talk about historical trauma, that's what I'm actually talking about. Power, love, and vision. And so let's keep that at the forefront as I talk a little bit about what do I mean by historical trauma, especially for a, a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and two-spirit relatives. And I'm just going to clarify, I'm using the term two-spirit to represent a placeholder. Not all of our community embraces that term, but it's the best term that we have to try to understand our sexual and gender identity and expression that's rooted in our indigenous traditions and not in the confines of Western constructs of what it means to be queer or gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Um, so I will use the term two-spirit. In terms of our history, let's talk a little bit about that too. Um, 
a lot of our history has been erased from the history books, and, and there's a reason for that, and I'll, I'll provide that context in a moment. But we do know from the research that there's been well over 150 tribes documented to identify two-spirit people historically in our tribal communities. Um, some of our tribes um, uh, quite often had names and, and roles associated with our two-spirit relatives. Uh, we know that uh, gender uh, was very diverse in our community. Some of our tribes had up to seven genders. Uh, so it was not a binary construct as we've been uh, taught in Western society. And the other piece to keep in mind is that although we did have same-sex sexual relationships, our, our behavior was, we were not defined by those behaviors, but rather by our social and ceremonial roles that we played in our communities. Uh, think about it more as about being homo-gendered, uh, or heterogendered rather than homosexual, um, in terms of having uh, our connectionness, uh, connectedness to each other. Uh, quite often there were uh, sometimes uh, a third gender status is a great way to try to describe people who were not male and not female. Um, and, and some of the researchers call it uh, women, men, or men, women. But we actually had tribal-specific terms. In, in my tribe, uh, we needed to decolonize some of those terms because uh, sometimes uh, when we've learned of these terms, it's terms like uh, in Choctaw, it was hobok. Uh, we were told by the missionaries that's what came through in our dictionary. But that's actually not the right term because that term means castrated person. Um, but actually, the term uh, that might be more appropriate is uh, tabokoa, uh, the noonday, the, the, the pinnacle of the sun, um, or the person who stands in between worlds. Uh, Creek scholar Marcus Briggs Cloud talks about two-spirit people. The traditional term for that uh, was the special stitch that was in a, uh, for bringing together a bandolier bag together. That one spot right in the middle is a very special sacred stitch. And that's the term for two-spirit people. It's the, the place where the two medicines come together. That's a very powerful way of understanding who we were and are in relation to our communities historically and contemporarily. Uh, we also know historically we used to do all kinds of these kind of in-between types of roles. And some of our tribes, we uh, were in charge of funerary rites um, to tra help to transition to the dead. Sometimes we were actually on the battlefield to tend to the wounded. Um, sometimes we actually were taken to treaty meetings to actually help decide. Uh, we were the ones who were the decision makers or the ones that the community looked to to be able to tell who was telling the truth or lying because we could understand and we could detect that. Um, we brokered marriages. Uh, we were healers in some of our communities. And um, in all cases, we, we seem to be historically to be the mediators of of either the spirit, between the spirit world and this world, or between human beings, we were the ones who were the, the brokers uh, of those kinds of relationships. Um, so we do know that from, from the historical record. So what happened? How did we lose track of some of that record? A lot of our communities still have that knowledge and still carry that knowledge and actually still carry particular ceremonial roles associated with two-spirit people. But we can't understand historical trauma and we can't understand the impact on our community without understanding settler colonialism. So you see, settler colonialism is, uh, consists of policies and uh, a system and structure that is designed to literally erase indigenous people or dispossess us of our land. And um, that erasure is manifest in not even having the stories passed on or being able to have access to that information. But it's important to understand that settler colonialism is not an event. It's not a one-time thing. It's actually this structure. It's the policies that are in place. It's the ways of thinking that are in place that support um, uh, uh, certain kinds of opportunities to uh, reinforce taking of land and er erasing indigenous presence on the land. A good example of some of those policies would be the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny. All of these are aligned to create stories or origin narratives um, to distort historical realities, to free future settler generations from guilt or accountability, and rationalize and normalize continuous settler occup occupation and rights to dispossess Native people of our lands, and to simultaneously erase us from uh, contemporary society and social discourse. 
So that is the stage to understand historical trauma. Historically traumatic events, however, are the actual events that uphold those kinds of structures. Um, a good example of that uh, uh, is to think about historical trauma. Um, these are events that are uh, perpetrated by human beings on a nation or on a people. It could it, it, by identity, could be by sexual orientation, it could be by all kinds of statuses, but it's designed to uh, do three things. To either eradicate a people, a tribe or a community, and that's quite often through genocide, or to, to eradicate our life ways. That includes uh, systematic destruction of culture, language, identity, religion, it's also known as ethnocide, and eradicate our thought ways, how we think about ourselves, our worldviews, our indigenous knowledges, our epistemologies, or what is known as epistemicide. The trauma is usually collective, it's experienced by the whole group, um, and it's uh, compounding over generations. It's usually not one kind of event, but several events that are targeted to disrupt people's abilities to live in healthful ways. Good examples of this, um, these types of historically traumatic events uh, are manifest throughout the United States history, including putting native people into slavery, um, giving smallpox blankets to, to people, putting people under forced uh, relocation and uh, forced onto reservations, more contemporarily in the last hundred years, uh, being forced into boarding schools is a good example of that. Uh, boarding schools were designed, uh, starting especially in the 1880s, designed to systematically destruct um, indigenous identities and life ways. And why does that matter in terms of two-spirit people in particular? Um, it's because during that same period, they put into place something called the Court of Indian Offenses. So if you're found practicing your religion or your culture or any of your ceremonies, you could be uh, put into prison or have your food rations withheld. So the combination of putting children into boarding schools uh, where they were torn away from their families, forced to be put in, into these schools, hundreds of thousands of our children were put away into these schools, um, which were actually designed to forcibly keep them away from their culture at the same time as the Court of Indian Offenses Act. Those two things were really important because they both mandated basically um, uh, Christianity to be taught um, to native uh, people and to replace uh, our traditional ways of knowing and being. And the average uh, time that children pl were put into these boarding schools were about seven years. So they were removed from their families for, uh, on average, at least seven years. So you can imagine that they didn't get exposed to their traditional teachings about uh, coyote and when coyote takes off his penis and transforms into a woman. You didn't hear traditional stories about sexuality and gender and gender identity and expression. Historical trauma still had an impact on people's uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as well as um, substance use. In other words, uh, the more chronic the historically traumatic event exposures that your ancestors had, the more likely you were to experience uh, struggles with addiction as well as um, PTSD in the present generation. So indeed, some of these stories still uh, persist in our bodies and in our actions today. So belonging, acceptance of who, who we are meant to be, becoming out, not just coming out, not just the outward expression of coming out, but becoming who we are always meant to be. Other people reported key turning points for themselves. And it was, again, about this importance of having just one ancestor, one relative, one community member, one auntie, one grandmother, one grandfather, one person in their life who saw them and said, you belong in this, sa this sacred circle in our community, in our family. And then I'm going to end with that. Yokoki, thank you. Thank you so very much, Karina. Now it is my honor to introduce to you Colonel Greta Kammermeyer. Greta joined the Army at the age of 19. And in 1988, as part of military security clearance, she disclosed that she's a lesbian, resulting in the termination of her 25-year military career. She challenged her discharge in federal court, won, and was reinstated. Her story was told in the movie, Serving in Silence, 
produced by Barbara Streisand and Glenn Close as Greta Kammermeyer. Dr. Greta Kammermeyer earned her PhD from the University of Washington and now lives on Whidbey Island with her wife and two dogs. Next, she will be singing two of her original songs, You Can Do Anything, and Did You Ever Imagine This? It is my distinct pleasure to welcome the incomparable, the great Greta Kammermeyer. You can do anything. You can do anything better than you thought. Me to believe you have the power you saw. Life has been tough and you keep pushing through. You're within reach of the dream of your youth. You can do anything you send your mind to. Believe in yourself and you will thrive. to be a kid different from the rest make choices that were not always best not part of the group no friends to let in loneliness persists no comfort from within so much to endure so much to conceal will I survive life's ordeal and then I heard you can do anything better than you thought Life has been tough and you keep pushing through. You're within reach of the dream of your youth. You can do anything you set your mind to. Believe in yourself and you will thrive. Raised at a time when roles were set, boys could do anything with no regret. Girls were defined and had no choice. Slowly we changed and broke those chains. Still did not know what lay ahead. What do I need to dread? But then I heard, you can do anything better than you thought. You need to believe you have the power you saw. Life has been tough and you keep pushing through. You're within reach of the dream of your youth. Did you ever imagine a scourge would arise? Millions afflicted and thousands would die. In the midst of it all, heroes arise, caring for those who without them would die. Did you ever imagine this? would invade. It came with a vengeance, spreading day by day. We quarantined in place to keep people safe. No work, school, or travel till viruses erased. Trails would be empty, beaches only sand. Planes and ships stranded, no place to land. Thank you so much, Colonel Greta Kammermeyer for an incredible performance and a heartfelt tribute to those we lost over the last year. Don't forget that we have already survived a pandemic. Professor Charles Emlett is with Aging with Pride and is a leading researcher in the field of HIV, has continually helped move the practice and science of HIV work forward. Charles shares with us that life-threatening illness and loss can trigger trauma and painful experiences from the early days of HIV. Support from the community is more difficult due to social distancing. Yet, strategies of resilience experienced by those living with HIV can be employed again to maintain well-being. Aging with Pride has found that community involvement is critical and significant in resilience among those living with HIV. And when we think of HIV and resilience, what is most important are the voices of survivors. 
it is my pleasure to welcome Leo Egashira, a board member of Gen Pride, who every day illustrates the resilience of our long-term survivors. Please welcome Leo. I was diagnosed HIV positive in 1992, although it's more than likely I contracted it by 1987. I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area at the early stages of the HIV epidemic and saw firsthand the devastation of the gay male community. In the year I was diagnosed, I lost my best friend from college in New York City and my partner of five years. Besides the premature death sentence that an HIV diagnosis meant, there was also unfathomable stigma. Most people tried to hide their condition until the physical manifestations of AIDS no longer afforded them the luxury. Whether it was the Kaposi sarcoma lesions that my partner had on his face and arms, or emaciation, or fatigue. That stigma and the accompanying fear meant that many AIDS patients lost family and friends when they needed them the most. Even though I was taking 19 pills a day on a crazy, crazy regimen, and I know people who were taking 30, these were not effective therapies as people continue to die. I honestly did not think I'd live to see the year 2000. So, after my diagnosis in 1992, I vowed to embark on at least one trip of a lifetime each year until I was no longer physically able to do so. So, I kayaked in Glacier Bay, Alaska for 11 days, backpacked across Baffin Island in Arctic Canada for two weeks, and explored the canyons of southern Utah. With the advent of effective therapies in the late 1990s, it looked like I was going to survive HIV. I am acutely aware that I have been given a new lease on life. Every day I live is a gift, and I try to make it as such, not only for myself, but in tribute to the many thousands who succumbed to AIDS well before their time. For the past 20 years, I've continued the tradition of doing at least one trip of a lifetime each year. And I've even started doing two such trips a year. Even at my current age of 66, I still hope to backpack and kayak in the wilderness where I find my soul. Just as I witnessed the needless waste of life and political cowardice of the Reagan administration in the 1980s, I now see the same thing with the coronavirus in the malfeasance of the Trump administration. I am angry that I won't be able to do some things that I had hoped to do in my ever-shortening lifespan. I am angry that fellow Americans have had to put their lives on hiatus or have their lives completely disrupted. I am angry that young people may not even get to start their education and careers. But I am glad that enough people share my anger to actualize regime change and a new start. We will survive and eventually thrive again. Thank you, Leo. You're an inspiration to all of us. Before we announce this year's Trailblazer Award, I want to give you a fundraising update. I don't believe that you have not donated yet to ending social isolation. Alyssa Tirado Strayer, the manager of Healthy Gen Center at the University of Washington, gave and shared this with us. Older adults and the younger generations have so much to offer the world around them. But now is a time when generations have even less access to each other than usual. I give because these programs can infuse our community with the voices, humor, and wisdom of our elders that we need to guide us now. Please click on the green donate button at the top of this page. Thank you so much. We are thrilled to announce Stephen Sawyer and Phyllis Little as our trailblazers for this year. POCAN's two long-standing leaders. We honor and recognize your leadership, your resilience, and your commitment to serving communities, often in the margins of Seattle and the greater Seattle King County area. Their steadfast work addressing HIV and health in black and African American communities has been unparalleled. This event's purpose is to remember those who went before us, honor those leading us today, and take a quick peek into the future.
Phyllis was one of the founders of POCAN, and we honor her incredible pioneering work, her fortitude, when so much was unknown and unsupported. Stephen, we celebrate and recognize you for your long-term board leadership at POCAN, and more recently, your guiding and guidance as the executive director. We are thrilled to appreciate your impact today recall, while recalling those who have gone before us and respecting your leadership as you bring us and build a better future for so many people. I wanna now turn our attention to last year. As some might recall, we started the Legacy Letters Program as a first step to combat social isolation. And those in fact were some of the most touching moments in our gala as those of you that were there, as people were sharing their letters between young and older. And I wanna share just a few of these. David, 23, shared, I grew up in a very Catholic environment, surrounded by people not such as myself. I've not taken my identity into account in any professional setting. I knew I might be different from puberty, but then things started setting in. But for some reason, I had this internal instinct that those feelings were wrong. They're for should not be explored or discussed. I would like to learn from the LGBTQ community elders, what is it like being part of a community? What was it like years ago? What is it like for you today? I wanna to learn other ways of embracing my sexuality and what it means to be a part of this community other than going out to gay bars. I wanna stand up for my rights and all others who have been marginalized. I want to break down walls, put up, by our society. Mark answered back, I grew up in the 1940s and 50s, and at that time, people didn't talk about homosexuality, and if it was talked about, it was a disgusting thing. I spent most of my adult life thinking that I shouldn't have these thoughts and desires. It wasn't until the 1980s that I finally came out very late in my life, when being gay was more accepting. The LGBTQ community taught me that I could be proud of myself. And once I came out, I learned to respect myself more and become proud of being a gay man. I see that is what you are doing. Even though you came out young, now I'm in my 80s. And I hope you and others in the community don't have the same self-doubts about yourselves as I did. But when you do, respect yourself and be proud of who you are. Surround yourself with those who love you, who can support you. Love yourself above all else. It's my pleasure now to welcome Greg Scully, a dynamic operations specialist at our institute. He has extensive experience identifying and resolving strategic and operational issues. Greg has more than 25 years experience working with high level government officials and serving NGOs in developing countries. Greg engages in board leadership roles with several nonprofits. Greg, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you, Karen. For decades, there have been few opportunities to build connections between older and younger generations. Today, both older and younger generations experience high levels of social isolation. COVID-19 and physical distancing cause even more disconnection and loneliness. The pandemic has separated everyone, and yet it has also created an appreciation for our interdependence. Our research reveals how loneliness and isolation affect our community. Tonight, we're excited to announce a new program designed to strengthen our interdependence. We're launching a new mentorship program called Gen to Gen. Gen to Gen will connect younger and older people through one-on-one -on -one conversations and support. People will form new and meaningful bonds. Our cutting edge research into vulnerable populations helped us to develop Gen to Gen. It's an innovative solution to improve health, well-being, and longevity. We developed Gen to Gen in our Age Pride Healthy Gen Center, where community partnerships strengthen our programs. I'm very excited to tell you that our first Gen to Gen nonprofit community partner is Youth Care. Our research teams deliver groundbreaking analysis, providing tools to deepen our understanding of aging 
especially the experiences of LGBTQ plus elders. I'm donating to the Healthy Gen Center to help launch Gen to Gen. This program is a way to help reduce loneliness for elders by connecting them with younger people. I love it that my donation to Gen to Gen will link our generational gaps. You can help build up our community and combat social isolation by donating right now. Come on this journey with me. Together, we'll help launch this exciting program. Our donations will pay for matching Gen to Gen participants, advancing Gen to Gen with community partners, and ensuring that everyone can participate and receive ongoing support. I want to live in a community where older people grow with younger people in ways that help everyone to thrive. I'm inviting you to join me and donate to make a difference. Your gift is an investment in building up the community. Your contribution will help reduce the loneliness and disconnection that Karen addressed. We launched the Gen to Gen program through an anonymous $5,000 donation. There are a few of you who have the means to give $5,000. Your investment would provide staff support for 20 Gen to Gen participants. Or perhaps you can contribute at the $1,000 level, helping us expand Gen to Gen to four new nonprofit community partners. And many of you can afford $200, which would fund background checks, securing added protection for five Gen to Gen participants. Whatever you can afford, please give what you can now. Every dollar makes a difference. Let's honor yesterday, celebrate today, and prepare for tomorrow. Please give generously to support Gen to Gen. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. This is such powerful work, work we as a community need to support. Please help us reach our goal by hitting that green donate button now at the top of your screen. Ruben Rivera Jackman did. Ruben is Director of Supportive Services at Imagine Housing and shared this with all of us. The COVID-19 crisis has closed schools and enforced social distancing, cutting off many youth from primary means of psychological support, putting them at higher risk of developing anxiety and depression. I relate to these teenagers. I'm donating to Gen to Gen to help our teens. Ruben, you are the best. And now I am so excited to introduce to all of you, Lady A, who is the hardest working woman in blues, soul, funk, and gospel. Our Seattle's Lady A confronts white privilege in battle with country stars and beyond. Lady A has performed and released several albums under her stage name for years. The unexpected spotlight came upon this Seattle blues singer when pop country hitmakers Lady Antebellum decided earlier this summer to shorten its name to a longtime fan nickname. You guessed it right, Lady A. As Lady A shared, I've been working my butt off since before those kids were born, but your privilege is going to allow you to take something from me or decide that I have to share the name with you knowing full well that you're going to wipe me off social media. Therefore, you're still taking from me. But Lady A doesn't give up, and you should hear her swaggering, full-throated bellow on her new album, Live in New Orleans, or as they say, Live in New Orleans. It is my honor to welcome to all of you and to all of us into your homes the amazing, the talented, the beautiful, and the one and only Lady A. Woo! 
I woke up this morning, sunlight in my eyes. The smell of coffee, no, it's time to rise. I sang hard all week, now I'm ready for the weekend. Going down to Jackson, y'all, do it all over again. You ask me how I'm doing, baby, I'm loving life and I'm doing fine. Doing fine, yes, I'm doing fine. See Mississippi, well, that's like my second home. Greenwood, Jackson, Clarksdale, I'm never alone. I drive down to Nashville, up to Memphis, Tennessee. Gonna sing my heart out with the band down at BB King's. You ask me how I'm doing. Baby, I'm loving life and I'm doing fine, doing fine. Yes, I'm doing fine. Hop like the sweet on to the Netherlands. I blues cruise to France, y'all. I'm singing everywhere I can. Cause it's life I lead. God has graced it with style. I get to sing for folks like you. I hope I make you smile. Cause you ask me how I'm doing Baby, I'm loving life and I'm doing fine Doing fine Yes, I'm doing fine Forty-five's trying to kill us Turn us one against another But how you get around that, y'all? Love your sisters and brothers Don't let nobody steal the joy you have there's no time for negativity, no time to sit and be mad. You ask me how I'm doing, baby, I'm loving life and I'm doing fine, doing fine. Yes, I'm doing fine. Take a red eye home for a few more days. See my people go to church, y'all, because you know I got to pray. Cause it's life I lead, God has graced it with style. I got to sing for folks like you, I hope I made you smile. Cause you ask me how I'm doing, baby I'm loving life and I'm doing fine. Yes I'm doing fine, well I'm doing fine, doing fine. Yes I'm doing fine, well I'm doing fine, doing fine. Wow, wow, wow. What an incredible performance from Lady A. Thank you so much from all of us. We are so close to meeting our goal. So if you haven't yet, please give now. And if you have given, please do consider giving generously. We want to hit our goal this evening. So in advance, we want to share with you our gratitude. From my native land of the Philippines, I want to say salamat po. Thank you. This event wouldn't be possible without the generosity of our presenting sponsors. Ages Living, Long-Term Care Advisors, Gen Pride, and of course, close to my heart, the University of Washington School of Social Work. Our Change Makers, Seattle Counseling Service. The Stranger, the UW School of Social Work, Tacoma, Hot 97.3 FM, and 
Mix 95.7 FM. And our allies, the Greater Seattle Business Association, the GSBA, Pierce County Aging and Disability Resources, CareForce, and the UW de Tournay Center School of Nursing, the Tacoma Older LGBT Center, Bayview Retirement Community, New Chapter Weddings and Events, and the Seattle Gay News. As I bid you goodbye, please stay safe, stay sane, stay sexy, and please stay at home. Take care of each other, continue to love each other, but above all, love yourself first so you can take care of each other. We look forward to seeing you next year. So on behalf of our committee, I say once again, thank you and salamat po. And again, as a thank you, we just won't stop thanking you. We wanna end our evening with a special encore performance from Lady A. Enjoy the rest of your evening and good night. I wrote this song for my grandmother. Y'all put your hands together out there. This song is called Honey Hush. Back in the day on 22nd and Pine, my grandma fried fish, going gin and wine. Friends and family, music playing loud. My daddy pulling up, y'all, big, bad, and proud. Kids in the backyard, clothes hanging on the line. Miss Pauline and my mom and them, wigs looking real fine. Right about then, somebody started to cuss. I could hear my grandmama saying, Honey hush, honey hush, to you girls when y'all are talking trash. Honey hush, to that slick talking man that makes you want to laugh. Honey hush, to the kids when they make you want to fuss. Honey hush, say honey hush. Look, watching my mama getting ready to hit the town. The Esquire Club, black and tan, when they was around. Silver wigs, high heel shoes, with long, pretty white gloves. A child burst with pride, my heart was filled with love. We supposed to be in the bed, so we don't hear mama fuss. In the back of my mind, I hear my dear say, Honey hush, honey hush, to you girls, when y'all are talking trash. Honey hush, to that sick talking man that makes you want to laugh. Honey hush to the kids when they make you want to fuss. Honey hush, say honey hush. Look, I was down in Jackson, Mississippi, some place I'd never been. I was hanging with Dexter Allen, him and all his kin. Sunday dinner at Miss Ruthie's house, she made such a fuss. I said, girl, that food is good. She said, honey hush, honey hush. When the food is so good, you can't get enough. Honey, hush. Someone makes you mad, you think you want to cuss. Honey, hush. When you and your friends are caring on the such. Honey, hush. Say, honey, hush. Honey, hush. To your girl, when y'all are talking trash. Honey, hush. To that sick talking man that makes you want to laugh. Honey, hush. To the kids, when they make you want to fuss. Honey, hush. Say honey hush, honey hush. The food is so good you can't get enough. Honey hush. Someone makes you mad, you think you want a cup. Honey hush. When you and your friends are carrying on and such. Honey hush. Say honey hush, honey hush. Put your hands together out there, honey hush. Say honey hush. Honey hush, say honey hush, come on. Honey hush, say honey hush. Honey hush, woo! You feel better when you clap, honey hush. Say honey.